So welcome to those who are joining us on the internet as we continue our service together. As we begin, we're going to be open in prayer, but there's a number of things that I've been asked that, uh, as a church, we would pray for. There may be things that others will want us to pray for in the time that lies ahead, and I'm sure uh, I'll get a message about that. First of all, um, Anne and Dave Burnett have asked if we could pray for their daughter, Tracy, and her husband, Steve. Uh, Steve has... Um, He's collapsed to investigate and see what the cause of it is. So um, he's in hospital. Tracy, as you would expect, isn't able to visit her uh, husband just now. So do please remember the couple, remember the wider family there in our prayers. And it would be a mess if we didn't also mention the tragic uh, uh, fire incident in a home in St. Neans. Um this week. Two young children aged three and seven uh, sadly lost their lives in the fire and there were injuries for the parents so we'll spend our time and we will pray for them as well. Let's come together in prayer. Let's pray. Lord and Heavenly Father, as we meet together just now, we meet very much with, with hearts that are coming with anxiety, concern, uh, as we hear the news of, of the, uh, uh, the tragedy and, and the heartache of things that lie around us in our community. We pray for this family in St. Neots. We cannot imagine how the family are feeling just now. See the tragic death of two young children, the injuries of the parents. We pray for the parents as we pray for anyone else in the wider family and their friends. We pray, dear Lord and Heavenly Father, that uh, through this time may they be able to discover comfort when it seems hard to grasp, peace when it seems impossible. We pray that, dear Lord and Heavenly Father, that in the midst of tragedy, in the midst of heartache, may they each be able to sense love, loving arms around each and every one of them. We pray also for Steve and Tracy. Remember Steve in hospital, and we remember also Tracy who was unable to visit her husband through this time. And once again, for the wider family, for the, uh, Tracy's parents, Anne and Dave, and anybody else uh, within the family, those concerns they've got, the anxiety that they're experiencing, Lord and Heavenly Father, may they have that sense, Lord, that you are with them. Your promise is that you will be with them. Your promise is that you'll walk every step of the road with them. And in this journey of life, may they have that sense that they are not walking alone, but you are grasping their hand, leading them, guiding them. But you are giving wisdom to those in the hospital that are seeking to find the answers to Steve's needs just now. And as we approach so very soon the time of Christmas, we also remember, this is a time which we remember one who was born into a world in which the message came, there is no room. There is no room in the inn. And to this very day there are still those who are saying there is no room. There is no room in the hearts of so many for Jesus. And we pray that in the midst of all these things, the things that will be going out on the internet, through television and radio. We pray, dear Lord and Heavenly Father, that in the midst of all that's being heard, may we discover through this time a message that surely is the heart of the Christmas message. A message of love, a message of joy, 
a message of peace. And so we pray this in your name's sake. Amen. Amen. I'd like to ask Derek if you'll come and read from Acts 17. Thank you. Silas and Timothy in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicoreans and Sotic officers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seemed to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him, brought him to a meeting of the Arabacus, where they said to him, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears and we would like to know what they mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. <coughs> Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Arapachus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every day you are very religious. For as I walk around and look carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I am going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in the temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything, rather himself, gives everything life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations. <coughs> that they should inhabit the whole earth and he marked out their appointment times in history and the boundaries of their land. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. Though he is not far from any of us, for in him we live and move and have our beings as some of, you, of your own poets have said we are his offspring therefore since we are God's offspring we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone an image made by human design and skills in the past, God overlooked such ignorance. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of, his, of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, 
Some of them sneered, but others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. At that, Paul left the council. Some of the people became followers of Paul and believed among them was Dionysus, a member of the Arapacus, also a woman named Demarius, and a number of others. Let's begin. Paul Thank you, Derek. Some of you will be aware that uh, we're going through a time that's known as Advent, meaning the coming, the coming of Jesus. As we look to towards Christmas, not so many days away. So as we spend our time in our service today, there is that sense of looking to the coming of Christ. But I want to suggest also, not only is there a sense in which we are looking to the coming of Christ, but in the midst of our time of fellowship this morning, today, in the midst of our time of fellowship, may we also not forget, it is a time of pandemic. There is a sense in which our passage today kind of draws those two aspects together, the coming of the one who can make the difference and will make the difference in any tragedy of life. And the pandemic, as it was known 2,000 years ago. Many years ago, I heard the history of the altars to the unknown God. And it's particularly relevant, it's particularly relevant for today because it's a story of an epidemic that hit Athens. They had presented offerings to multiple gods who just couldn't help. They tried and tried and there wasn't any answer coming and they were kind of at their wits end. So they contacted an oracle. Uh, <clears throat> who uh, told them they're under a curse. Well, that's what the oracle said. And the only solution to the epidemic was to contact a miracle worker named Epimendes, who lived in Crete. So he told them how to uh, appease whatever God was holding them accountable for their sins. They were to bring in a, a flock of sheep and wherever one lay down, an altar was to be built. They were to sacrifice the sheep on such an altar, just where it lay. The altars were designated to an unknown God. So after admitting they didn't know to whom they were sacrificing, they repented, they followed they followed his instructions and the epide epidemic came to a close. And they would never be able to forget that epidemic. Whenever they looked around, they saw all the different altars and they were a very religious kind of group there. They saw all the altars to the different gods. But in the midst of it was always that reminder, there's someone out there who can actually help. There is somebody there who can actually meet our need. Even in the midst of an epidemic, there is someone who can meet their need. And in the midst of all that we are experiencing today, there is one who can meet our need. There is one who can meet our need. And you know, that, that starting point, when Paul is speaking to them, is at that starting point of the unknown God. That Paul is saying, here, do you want to know who really helped you? You know, it's not stone set up on the hillsides. It's not lumps of wood. There's a real character here. And I've come here to tell you about him. Because he is the one who helped you in the epidemic. 
He is the one who will help you whatever you're facing through life today. And if Paul was standing here today, Paul would be saying, this is the same one who can meet our needs in the 21st century, in 2020 and beyond. He's been there. He's walked every step of the road. And in our trust in him, we can find the answers to life. With our trust in him, there is a way forward. It's because Jesus came. Because Jesus came. Because Jesus was born uh, in Bethlehem. Because Jesus, the gift of God, the Son of God, came that we might know life. Life. And not just any kind of physical epidemic or pandemic, but a spiritual one too. And there's that spiritual pandemic, isn't there? There is a spiritual pandemic. There is that sense in which we are still waiting to open the door and let the one in who can do or give us all the answers. Knocking on the door is Jesus. He's knocking on the door of hearts and lives. And yet, the door stays firmly shut. Waiting for us to open waiting for us to open. We can learn some lessons as we look at how Paul approaches these people. Paul, wherever he went, was looking to see how he could share the good news. He discovered the good news on the road to Damascus. He sure discovered the good news as Jesus came and was there in the midst of the company. As he was coming with hate, Jesus came with love. As he was going to destroy, Jesus came to build, create a new life. And Jesus is the same one today, who comes that we might know life and know the light of the world in our lives today. When Paul was speaking to these folks here, he began where they are. He began where they are. These were very, as I said before, they are very religious people. They love to debate. That's pretty clear. And you know, you get people like that. They can spend all day debating and then go on the next day, still never coming to a conclusion. They love to debate. And so they took Paul into this area where they could debate what things were being heard, what new philosophies, as they saw it, were being presented. And so Paul begins at that point where they were, the philosophizing. He begins at that point as they interacted together. He begins at that point of the unknown God. And so he's saying, well, what's important to you? What's important to you? I always feel it's kind of important to grasp where people are. Some years ago, uh, I was involved in doing some Meals on Wheels. It was the WRBS in that area that was doing it. I um, don't know why I got involved, because that's supposed to be women, isn't it? <laughs> but there you are. I was involved on the rotor. And when I first started off, people said to me, now when you go to this particular house, we warn you, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be tough. She's a very difficult woman. And it doesn't matter what you do, you'll always be wrong. So I went along and it was just, as they said, it was, couldn't do anything right. Never mind. When I went the next time, to the same house. And when I went in, I noticed on the mantelpiece was a picture of a man in uniform. He was a policeman, and he was, clearly by his dress, he was a fairly senior rank in the police. 
and I asked the lady who this was. Clearly it was somebody who was important to her. It had pride a place in her living room. She began to speak about the person in the photograph. It was her son. And you couldn't get a better son than he was. And so she began to share just what she thought about her son. Despite being a good son, despite doing very well in his career, he was struck down with an illness which paralyzed him from the waist down. He had to give up his work. And as she spoke, you could see something of the heart right there. This great son, this wonderful son, and he's out of a job, he's got nothing. And yet, she says, I can look out the window, I can see all those people there who ever, never seem to do anything right. And they can walk, they can run, they can do all th things. But why not my son? Why not my son? It's a good question. You can see and sense how she's feeling in the midst of it. And when I went back the next time, there was a changed lady. No longer was she the one who seemed to find fault with everything. Here was a lady who was now speaking very pleasantly. And what was the difference? The difference was beginning where she was. Understanding what was important in her life. That picture said everything to her. This is my important part of my life. This is the important part of my life. Beginning there comes the opportunity to be able to see and discover and to share something better than we ever thought was possible. Begin where they are. And beginning where that lady was beginning where these people are in Athens. So we begin to be able to see the road that lies ahead in any spiritual conversation that takes place. Paul began where they were. What's important for you? Before it leads on to say, I've got something that's even greater importance. An even greater importance even greater, yes, than this idol to an unknown God. Because I want to tell you who the God is. I want to tell you what this God can do for you, has done and will continue to do for you. There is our hope. There is our hope. And in the midst of epidemics, in the midst of pandemics, here is the important reminder that we are looking towards the event of Christmas where God said he so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. There is hope. And that is the message of the coming of Christ. There is hope. There is hope when it seems impossible. And there is hope, not just for the physical aspects of illness, but that spiritual need. The spiritual need, so much is there within our world. So he went on from beginning where they are to bring Jesus to the poor. This Jesus who was born in Bethlehem. This Jesus that Paul met on the road to Damascus. This Jesus. This Jesus who came and was not only put to death, but he rose again. This Jesus who showed that he had the power to not only forgive sins, to cleanse sins, to give new life. It's the air. It's there. In our trust in Jesus as Saviour, it's there. It's there in this Jesus who isn't just the one who rose from the dead, but came that you and I might know life and life in abundance. And wherever we start, we need to continue to look to the one who is the 
antidote. Look to the one who is the answer. Look to the one who can give to us all the answers to our every question. Jesus. Jesus, who not only died, but rose again. Jesus, who conquered sin, conquered death. Jesus, who gives to us the promise of life and life in abundance. As we look to the coming of Christmas, may we always see it in the context, not just of a baby that's born in a stall, and we see in that babe all the innocence that's there. In the stall we see a helpless child, but we are seeing so much more. So much more. When I lived in Aden, I went into a shop with my mother. And this shop, they sold wall carpets. And then all kinds of manner of wall carpets. And the shopkeeper and my mother got into conversation. And the shopkeeper, this wasn't a Muslim country, the shopkeeper began to say how wonderful and great is his God. But he said, I feel sorry. I feel sorry for you because your God is just a helpless baby. Just a helpless baby that needed to be rescued from the water. Well, they debated together. They talked together. And clearly, in the midst of all the conversations that have been before, the wrong message had been passed through to this particular gentleman. A wrong message that didn't present the fullness of what Jesus is. But where was the water coming into this? And eventually, in desperation, the shopkeeper went into the back. He says, I'll show you what I mean. There he was thinking he needed to teach this person their own faith. Came back and showed them this wall carpet. And on the wall ca carpet was the picture of Moses in the bulrushes. Moses in the bulrushes. Which for his thinking, this must have been the Jesus that people are talking about. This must have been the one that needed to be rescued from the bulrushes. He got a lot of things wrong there. An awful lot of things wrong. You know, when we present Jesus, you know, we need to recognize he is coming, yes, in a stall. Yes, he's coming. There was no room in the inn for him there. Yes, he's coming as a helpless baby. But he's coming with a mission, a mission that can only be accomplished by a God who loves you and loves me. He's coming with a mission to save. He's coming with a mission to give to us the opportunity of new life. New life by trusting Jesus as Saviour, by trusting Jesus as our Lord, by giving to him our heart, our whole heart, wholly, completely unto him. That takes not just somebody helpless, but somebody with the power and the authority of God. The authority of the Heavenly Father. That's the Jesus I know. That's the Jesus I know. That's the Jesus for us today. That's the Jesus for the world in which he created. This God who made the world, Paul says, and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and doesn't live in temples built by human hands. You know, there isn't anything that holds him in. And when Paul speaks like that, remember how it was that John spoke of when the Son of God came into this world and puts it all in eternity, puts it all in eternity when he relates how the Son of God, the Father and the Spirit were all one at the beginning. In the beginning was the Word. In the beginning was the Word. And we see that Word coming into flesh full of the glory of the Father, full of the glory of the Father. And when he describes it, he says that's full of grace and truth. 
Not just grace and not just truth. Full of grace and truth. Full of grace and truth. Jesus came with the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but by me. So he came with all of that. But he also came with the grace. And on the cross of Calvary, on the cross of Calvary, we see the greatest demonstration of love that could ever be. The Son of God, whose life was given for us. Whose life was given that we might know life. And we might know life in abundance. But you know, the third thing that we all need to take account of, <coughs> excuse me, the third thing that we need to all take account of is that we need to be as Jesus intended us to be. It's not just about an academic learning about Jesus. It's not just about an academic learning of the Son of God. But if we want to know what it is to go beyond the spiritual pandemics of this world, we need to be as Jesus intended. We are needing to become the offspring of God. Born again. Born anew. Jesus said, you must be born again. Kind of basic. Nicodemus didn't fully understand that. Uh, it was beyond him. Now, he was a pretty clever man, yet he couldn't understand a very basic teaching here. Does that mean I need to go back into my mother's womb? Uh-uh, says Jesus. No. Because he was talking about something spiritual here. He was talking about new birth. To be born, not of the flesh, but to be born of the Spirit. To be born of God. The offspring. And when we trust Jesus as Saviour, when we trust Jesus as Lord, we begin a new life. The, the epidemics of our lives are past. The spiritual uh, aspects of our life that aren't quite as they should be are past. We are born anew. Born anew. Something that can be known. Can be known as it was then, so now we can know it. And as we come in repentance, and we trust Jesus as Saviour and as Lord in repentance. We come believing, and not just about believing something, not just believing about something, but believing in. Huge difference. A huge difference. You know, we can say uh, that we believe aircraft in uh, the normal times. It's a bit different now. But in normal times, we can believe that aircraft will be able to get us from this country to anywhere else in the world. We believe it. And so we know it academically. But the belief doesn't really come to its full context until we come to the point of going up the steps and sitting upon that aircraft and belting ourselves in and allowing the aircraft to fly. That's belief, isn't it? Trust. Not believing about, but believing in. Believing in and knowing. Without a shadow of doubt, this is going to happen. I'm trusting. I'm trusting. I'm trusting so much. I put my whole weight, my whole weight within it. Trust. I'm very much recognizing that, that a lot of people do have a great fear of flying. Uh, and I guess a lot of it is about we like to be in control. We want to be the ones in charge. That's part of human nature. So we want to be in control. And when we sit as passengers in an aircraft, we know we're not in control. There's a pilot there at the front. And the pilot is the one who's flying. The pilot is the one who's taking us. It's even more worrying when we realize the pilot has to trust something else. We think it's the pilot. The pilot has to trust his instruments. And when he doesn't trust the instruments, the aircraft 
will not get to its destination. It will not get to its destination. I used to live on an island in the Hebrides and there was an aircraft that used to come in every day. Everybody trusted it would come in. And one day I was going through the town of Port Ellen with Joan and as we went through, I saw this Nimrod hovering above. I used to work on Nimrods and I think, well, what's it doing here? And the word had soon got around that this regular aircraft that was coming back and forth to the island hadn't reached the airport. It had landed on the hillside. And so everybody that was able went and climbed up that hillside to see what they could do to help. How did they get there? The pilot looked out the window. He saw the inlet. He recognised that inlet. He'd been there before. He knew that, what that inlet was. Except it wasn't the inlet he thought it was. Instead of relying on the instruments, he relied on his own insight. It's not our insight that makes the difference. It's our trust, not merely in an instrument, but in a perfect human God, perfect God, who has the answers to our every need. Trust him. Nothing else, no one else, but trust him. And he is what brings to us the salvation we need, the hope we need, the love we need, the joy we need, and the peace that we need. Trust him. He is the answer to our every need. Let's spend a few moments now in prayer. Let's pray. Lord and Heavenly Father, thank you because you begin where we are. You see our need. You let to meet our need. You recognise that each one of us comes as, as individuals with different needs. But one goal that needs to be discovered. And know that goal in you. Help us, Lord. Whatever may be troubling us in this room, or may be troubling folks throughout the world on the internet here today, wherever you may be, may each one of us discover you're the one that has the answer. You've got the comfort we need. You've got the peace that we need. You've got the love we need. You've got the hope every one of us is needing in our lives. And so we look to you. In Jesus' name, we pray.